America's young people to travel the world, help people in need, promote goodwill along the way. That challenge became the Peace Corps, and tonight our story comes from Sierra Leone, a poor African nation where a brutal civil war forced the Peace Corps to pull out over a decade ago. Tonight, our own Ron Allen has the story of the first U.S. volunteers to venture back in. Jessica Arians now does without so many things she took for granted back home in New Hampshire. She draws well water for a morning bucket shower. Breakfast is fried chicken and pineapple, made by the family she's staying with in this rural African village. It's hard being away from home. It's hard like waking up and thinking like, I want, someone was saying like, I want an ice Starbucks iced coffee and you know that you're not gonna get that for two years. Arians is among 37 US Peace Corps volunteers just assigned to Sierra Leone. A desperately poor nation devastated by a decade long civil war and so dangerous, even the Peace Corps pulled out. <laughs> 16 years later, the first American trainees are back. Learning the local language, preparing to be teachers in schools so ravaged, students often don't even have books or pencils. Scott Sawyer was a firefighter in Northern California. You know, when things are hard, they're good. And that's kind of what the Peace Corps is about. Go fresh, fish, snap, huh? The most important step yeah. is learning to live like the people they're here to serve. I wanted to be in a situation where I could lend my skills to people who actually need it. Um, and there's no better place than here. Ikema Achalihu has his possessions in a single room. No running water or electricity, just a few comforts of home. This is very basic. Very basic, yeah. Bare minimum, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sarah, nice to they first came together in Washington this summer, recruits to a program of civilian ambassadors launched by President Kennedy in the 1960s. The government here pushed hard to convince and encourage the Peace Corps to return, a process that took several years. Leaders here hope the arrival of the Americans sends a clear signal to the rest of the world that this country is peaceful, safe, and moving forward. Over the years, volunteers have left a lasting impression. I'm singing, Lord, Lord, Lord. Ahmed Smart is an accountant here with fond memories of an American teacher from 40 years ago. If you saw her, what would you say to her? I would say, very big thanks to her. It's those stories and the warm welcome the Barejos believe will help them through tough days ahead, including the drudgery of laundry. Show me your knuckles. <laughs> My war wounds. Their goals are realistic. We're not going to turn the country around, like develop it, but if we can at least teach kids. Do our little part. About what we know, that's something to us. They're carrying on what's been a tradition and adventure for young Americans lending a hand in far-flung corners of the world. Ron Allen, NBC News, Bo, Sierra Leone. And because they are carrying on a great tradition, in the almost 50 years since the Peace Corps started, more than 200,000 Americans have served, after all, in 139 countries. We've asked our viewers to submit photos from their Peace Corps experiences. You can see a gallery of the images. Submit your own. That's nightly.msnbc.com. We're calling an electronic reunion. That's our broadcast for this Wednesday night. Thank you for being here with us. I'm Brian Williams. We sure hope to see you right back here tomorrow evening. Good night. Thank you all for coming. I'm Mary Jo Bain. I'm the academic dean here at the Kennedy School, and I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event. The John F. Kennedy Forum here at the Kennedy School is celebrating a number of events in honor of the 50th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's presidency, and tonight is one of those events. We are celebrating the fact that 50 years ago this week, President Kennedy announced the formation of the Peace Corps. We have with us tonight the current director of the Peace Corps and three past directors of the Peace Corps. They cover four administrations and about 
20 years of the Peace Corps' history. The Honorable Elaine Chow was director of the Peace Corps from 1991 to 1992 during the first, the first George Bush administration. Um, she went on to become the Secretary of Labor in the second Bush administration, and she was the longest serving Secretary of Labor, I believe, since, I don't know, aught five, World War II, <laughs> uh, and the first Asian American woman to be in the cabinet. She is currently a distinguished fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Mark Guerin was director of the Peace Corps between 1995 and 1999. Before that, he was an assistant to the president and director of communications for the Clinton White House. <coughs> Since 1999, he has been the president of Hobart and William Smith College. Gadi Vasquez was director of the Peace Corps between 2002 and 2006, during the second Bush administration. Uh, before that, he worked at the Security and Exchange Commission and worked in politics in California. He is currently Vice President for Public Affairs at Southern California Edison. Aaron Williams is the current director of the Peace Corps. He came to the Peace Corps uh, directorship from a long career in development with RTI International and USAID. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic way back in the late 60s. <coughs> Director Williams has asked that we begin our evening tonight by observing a moment of silence in honor and respect for a Peace Corps volunteer who passed away while serving in Niger a few days ago. Her name was Stephanie Chance, and our thoughts and prayers are with her family and her friends. Thank you for that. Uh, and now we will start the evening by thinking back 50 years ago this week when President Kennedy was at the University of Michigan late at night doing what you will see. How many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in Ghana, technicians or engineers? How many of you are willing to work in the foreign service and spend your lives traveling around the world? On your willingness to do that, not merely to serve one year or two years in the service, but on your willingness to contribute part of your life to this country, I think will depend the answer whether a free society can compete. I think it can, and I think Americans are willing to contribute, but the effort must be far greater than we've ever made in the past. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Liberia between 1963 and 1965. I was in Liberia when President Kennedy was assassinated. I was in, I was in Monrovia. And as I look back on that experience in my own life, I can say that without question, it changed my life. Uh, it expanded the world for me. It introduced me to public service. It set me on the path through the careers that I've had up until that time. Those of us who were in Liberia at that time were mostly teaching. We were teaching in elementary and secondary school. I was in a secondary school in Cape Palmas, which is a town on, almost on the Ivory Coast border. And as I look back on that, I think, I think we did no harm. Uh, I think we taught a lot of children. Uh, I think we were pretty good ambassadors for the United States of America, and I think we probably helped keep President Tubman in, in office for an additional couple of years, which might or might not have been a good thing. Um, you know, we certainly went in with the idealism to change the world, and I think came out with a little better sense of, of what it was. So that's one volunteer's reflection back. You guys have more recent and much broader experience. So I'm hoping you would start us off by each taking a few minutes just to speak briefly about the role of the Peace Corps in the lives of volunteers, 
in the lives of the nation and in the life of the world. Secretary Chan, would you start off? Well, I was not a volunteer. In fact, Carol Bellamy, my successor in 1993, was the first Peace Corps director who was a returned Peace Corps volunteer. And that was a big deal uh, with the agency because uh, the returned Peace Corps volunteers wanted very much a returned Peace Corps volunteer to be the director. Uh, so congratulations to Carol, who subsequently went on to United Nations as mm -hmm. well. I think my experience was, uh, as a director, was a very enlightening one for me as well. Um, I learned so much about the world, even though I myself uh, have had a very diverse background. And uh, just to sidetrack a little bit, you know, one of the reasons why I never became a volunteer was because I was an immigrant to this country. And our, my formative years were spent in just trying to survive in this country. So I didn't really understand that there were all these other opportunities, uh, institutions that were available. And also, uh, I was the oldest of six children and so, as a new immigrant family, it was my responsibility to help my parents uh, support my younger sisters. But my experiences coming as an immigrant was helpful in my experience as Peace Corps director when we tried to recruit, because we had underrepresentation in certain mm -hmm. ethnic and racial groups. And we, you know, I, we tried to find why that was happening. And a lot of times, for a lot of new uh, immigrants, the ability to forego income for two years was simply a luxury that not very, very many could afford. So that was helpful uh, in terms of crafting our message to attract a more diverse workforce. But speaking about, and I don't want to, there's so many wonderful people here, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, one of my most, um, vivid memories when I traveled abroad and visited volunteers was how much I learned from them mm -hmm. and how enthusiastic they were and how each one of them, regardless as to whether they've had good experiences, bad experiences, have all said that the two year or more, but mostly two year experience was a seminal part of their life. And as you mentioned, um, Mary Jo, they, their whole perception of the world changed. And sometimes volunteers were a little bit um, disappointed that they could not do more to contribute to improving a country. And what I tell them is, you know, you as a singular, single volunteer may not see the fruits of your labor, but I get a chance to travel throughout the world and see the collective work of volunteers, almost like generation after generation, spread across the world. And the picture that I see is a, is a powerful picture of, you know, uh, young Americans who are willing to devote their life to a country they've never been, to a place they've never seen, to people they've never known, and try to help. And that is a powerful statement. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for having us. Uh, and uh, like everyone up here, I think we've all been thinking this week, especially about the 50 years of the Peace Corps and what that would mean. And to your question, Mary, so I, I've been struck, certainly during my time as director and since, um, of the domestic dividend of the Peace Corps. I think Elaine reflected well about certainly the difference for individual Peace Corps volunteers, for the difference they make in villages and communities around the world. I think one thing just to put into the mix for our conversation here is the domestic dividend of what it means for our country. As Brian Williams reported, that now over 200,000 Americans have had this very deep and meaningful experience. What, is, what does that mean for the United States? When I was the director, there were six members of the Congress who themselves had been Peace Corps volunteers. Three Republicans, three Democrats. It's perfect. Uh, <laughs> but you All see supportive. It every, you see it everywhere. Certainly yeah. Dean Bain, Director Williams. People have gone on to lives of consequence in business and law and medicine and a whole range of fields. So it's it's with excitement that I think we all gather here um, for the 50th. I guess one thing, just as for opening comments to kick off, uh, I think it may be time for us to, those of us who care about the Peace Corps, and certainly when you think of the history of the Peace Corps, what President Kennedy did this bold idea, brilliantly executed by Sergeant Shriver. 
to cast an unflinching eye at the Peace Corps today, to honor its mission and its values, but to contemporize it for this next 50 years. We should scale up with more volunteers and more funding, as Director Williams is trying to do. Certainly we all know more Americans want to do it than the budget allows for. We should perhaps look at the length of service. Is it a one-size-fits-all in this current context of with more Americans coming to the Peace Corps with different experiences? Should we look at greater use of technology? When Sergeant Shriver went out to meet with the first uh, Peace Corps volunteers, they were sending postcards back home and getting answers every six months. The world has changed. How we, might we organize that differently? More partnerships with creative NGOs and groups around the world, and how do we expand international volunteer service with Service World and others? So as we celebrate the 50th, I think Shriver and Kennedy would be urging us to think in different ways for how do we turn the next 50 years, how do we honor the legacy of those 200,000 volunteers like Aaron and Mary Jo and others, and for past, present, and future volunteers take it to the next 50 years. So for my part, it was, it was a privilege of a lifetime to be the director of the Peace Corps. I think we would all agree with that. It is, uh, I think in many ways, the best position in Washington, and I'm excited to be able to reflect with you all in this conversation. I will build on what uh, Mark said with regard to serving as director of the Peace Corps was an opportunity of a lifetime. It was transforming for me because it gave me the opportunity to uh, lead and manage uh, an organization of volunteers and professional staff who, s who embraced fully and wholeheartedly the bold idea that Mark referred to that President Kennedy articulated. Subsequent to my duties as uh, director of the Peace Corps, I, was, uh, I served as ambassador to the United Nations organizations in Rome, Italy from 2006 to 2009, where we dealt principally with food and agricultural policy, the World Food Program, during the global food crisis. And uh, as I traveled uh, the world dealing with these new issues, uh, it was always a bit astounding to me that wherever I traveled, uh, the fact that I had been the director of the Peace Corps, even in countries where the Peace Corps did not have existing programs, had left such a meaningful and powerful legacy not only in capital cities and amongst the ranks of leaders of government, but amongst community leaders and people at the grassroots level, people who still remember uh, the impact of Americans serving in these communities. I will never forget my first trip overseas was to Afghanistan shortly after the bombing had ceased. And we were meeting with the, then the Minister of Women's Affairs in Kabul, which you can imagine in Afghanistan is a very uh, formidable task to serve in that ministry. The minister spoke great English. And I said to her, Madam Minister, you speak great English. Uh, where did you get your training? And she said to me, I was taught English by Peace Corps volunteers the last time the Peace Corps was here in Afghanistan. Those are the kinds of special moments that when you have these encounters, you realize the powerful legacy of the dividend that has been talked about internationally where presidents and prime ministers and ministers and leaders were touched by Americans in these rural villages and communities and have left that, that powerful legacy. As an ambassador, I had the opportunity to interact with many fellow chiefs of mission. In fact, just left Austin, Texas, where we had a gathering of former US ambassadors. And many of them introduced themselves to say, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I served in the Peace Corps. And one couple met in the Peace Corps. And today, their son, who served as a Peace Corps volunteer during my tenure, is now a foreign service officer. Therein lies another dividend, that the Peace Corps has produced many foreign service officers, many leaders of NGOs, uh, and many leaders of organizations around the world that are making an impact and making a difference. Uh, I will close with this. I was the first director of the Peace Corps post 9-11. Uh, and my wife looked at me and said, are you sure you want to take this job? This is going to be a tall order because she wondered if Americans might turn away from the idea of going overseas in the aftermath of 9-11. And a few communications press media folks uh, conducted interviews and said to me, once we're directly the first director after 9-11, uh, 
surely we must be concerned that Americans just may not want to go overseas as Peace Corps volunteers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, the numbers of applicants skyrocketed to historic levels. The interest in the Peace Corps escalated in a dramatic fashion. And I think it speaks volumes, one about the American spirit and the willingness that we're not content to just be spectators, but that in fact we want to be participants in shaping our world and our nation and the future of this world. But also the fact that Americans, young and old, were seeking the opportunity to advance that idea that President Kennedy articulated, and that 50 years later remains a bold and strong idea. And I've always believed that one of the tests of a great idea is its sustainability. And if a journey of 50 years is a test, we're in a great place to see the Peace Corps do even greater things in the years and generations to come. Thank you. What a wonderful introduction by my <laughs> fellow directors and by my fellow RPCV, Mary Jo. I'm honored to be here. And as I find it's a privilege to serve as the director of the Peace Corps, after having served as a volunteer in the Peace Corps, I never imagined that one day I'd have the opportunity to do this. And I'm also the great benefactor, <coughs> beneficiary of being able to travel and see volunteers throughout my tenure. I've now traveled to eight countries in the past year, and I've seen something that I'll call the Peace Corps Nexus, and Getty touched upon this a little bit. But let me just share what I consider to be one of the great, great success stories of the Peace Corps. When I go to a country, typically I'll meet with the ambassador and his or her country team. Invariably today, the ambassador or the BCM or member of the senior staff, they are former Peace Corps volunteers. I'll cross over to see the government officials, the prime minister, the president, the minister of health, minister of education. They have had probably in their early years a very positive experience with the Peace Corps volunteer. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about what I just saw last week in Ghana our very first Peace Corps country. I'll then go and visit with uh, our volunteers in the field. I'll see the marvelous work they're doing in education and health and information technology and small business development, et cetera. And I will run into the heads of the various international NGOs that are doing great work in the field of development. They also are Peace Corps alumni. So we've got this tremendous nexus wow. of the Peace Corps 50 years later, which is a great testimonial to the legacy of President Kennedy and I might add the dynamic leadership of Sergeant Shriver, who figured out the best way to find places for these volunteers to serve. I was just in Ghana last week. Ghana was our first country, as you heard in the, in the clip. President Kennedy said that night in the University of Michigan, would you serve, if you were going to be a doctor, would you serve in Ghana? And 10 months later, only 10 months later, the first group went to Ghana. Now, by any stretch of the imagination in the government, that is a miraculous <laughs> I'm sure we've all had, had experience with initiatives that didn't get launched in 10 months. So they're in Ghana. Now, we've had 50 years of uninterrupted service in Ghana. And I had a chance to meet with the leadership in Ghana in government, in the private sector, in the nonprofit civil society sector. Everyone, to the man and woman, told me they had had a very positive, seminal experience, a life-changing experience with a Peace Corps volunteer in those past 50 years. This is an incredible testimony to what the Peace Corps has done and the service that Americans have provided in one country like Ghana. And everywhere you go, you see these remarkable Americans who are dedicated to service, who are patient, who are innovative, who are linguistically skilled, who are making a difference at the grassroots level, working in community side by side. In many of the countries where Peace Corps serves, the Peace Corps volunteer might be the only American these communities will ever have the opportunity to get to know face to face. The true face of America, not what is exported and represents America, unfortunately, in too many cases. The volunteers want to have a quality experience as we grow. And as Mark mentioned, we need to grow because more Americans want to serve. As we grow the Peace Corps, we want to make sure it's a quality experience. We want to make sure we invest in training and in staff and support for volunteers, and we're doing that. And fortunately, the Peace Corps has always enjoyed bipartisan support on Capitol Hill, and we continue to, to enjoy that support. It's a marvelous thing. I think that one of the things that we need to do to build on the legacy of John F. Kennedy and the marvelous leadership, the dynamic leadership of Sergeant Shriver, is that we need to look for ways to expand the Peace Corps. 
This year, we moved into three new countries, Indonesia, Sierra Leone, and Colombia, three countries that were part of the Kennedy Shriver legacy. And we're going to continue to move into new countries as we look for ways to expand opportunities for Americans to serve. This is truly a great time for the Peace Corps. The 50th anniversary gives us a tremendous platform to re-engage with the American people. And one of the things that I've always told my staff and people I talk to about the 50th anniversary is that it's not so much as an opportunity for us to pat ourselves on the back and say, we served with a marvelous experience and look how much we gave, look how much we received. But truly, to let America celebrate the singular accomplishment, this wonderful idea that President Kennedy launched 50 years ago, October 14th, and look at what it has wrought. It is truly an amazing, amazing performance that in fact is sustainable. So I want to ask a couple of questions about the effects of the Peace Corps, and then I want to pick up on Mark's question about, about the future. But let me, let me ask you this question. Many of you have spoken, as, as I did, about the effects of the Peace Corps on the Peace Corps volunteers uh, and on training a cadre of uh, people who make contributions in, in other ways. But let me ask you to think more specifically, and I'd like to start with you, Director Williams, because you came out of the aid community uh, and came to the Peace Corps from working with USAID. What has the Peace Corps contributed positively and negatively to the development effort in Africa, in some of the less developed countries of the world? And then I hope others will come in on that question. I think, Mary Jo, the most important thing that the Peace Corps has contributed to the development process, and I think one thing that's important to put this in context, the development process is a generational process. The Green Revolution took place in the 60s. We now need to reinvest in food security worldwide. So it's a generational occurrence in terms of development. The Peace Corps has always worked at the grassroots level, at the community level, in terms of developing capacity, inspiring young people to want to get an education, to take on leadership responsibilities. And I think that is an important factor in what the Peace Corps provides, both in terms of the recipient countries and in terms of how Americans can interact on a global basis. That, to me, is really a bottom line accomplishment, one of the greatest returns on investment that we could ever hope to achieve, this developing capacity at the local level. You know, for example, whether we work in health or education, we tend to be trainer of trainers. We are the ones who are trying to make sure we extend the hand of the community, working on their priorities, because after all, we have to be invited into a country, and we work on national priorities. To me, that's the most important thing that we can do. Well, I think uh, the, the important thing is that, that the Peace Corps has to remain relevant. And, and part of that is, is, I think what the director has alluded to, is that you have to be, have a willingness to adapt to develop new programs that maintain the relevance of the Peace Corps in a host country. Again, you have to be invited. Uh, during my tenure, we opened a program in Mexico, which uh, was the first in the history of the Peace Corps. It, it required very delicate negotiations, defining the program so that it was acceptable to the host government. And it had to be very relevant and, frankly, a little bit out of the box of what the Peace Corps had traditionally done when going into countries. But this is what the government of Mexico and the representatives of the government were looking for. And so you have to uh, constantly be assessing, recalibrating, if you will, the programs uh, throughout the Peace Corps world to ensure that they're relevant, they're pertinent, and that it's not only yielding a, a, a positive for the host country, but frankly, that the volunteers closing out their service are walking away with a sense of fulfillment, a sense of accomplishment, which in turn, and in my view, creates uh, another recruiter for the Peace Corps once you come uh, back to the United States and begin to uh, readjust to, to home life. Uh, so I think those are, are, are critically important. I think the training component is very, very important. Uh, the, the component of training in country to Peace Corps volunteers is very, very relevant. Peace Corps want, volunteers want to feel like they're well-suited, well-trained, well-equipped uh, to be able to do their job so that there is that fulfillment and, frankly, that sustainability when the, the difficult times come. And I think any volunteer would tell you that those, those challenges uh, probably come earlier than later sometimes. And so that's, that's very, very important. So I think the relevance. I think in terms of what's negative, uh, I won't name names, but I will simply say that, that some of the most agonizing episodes of our time, and I'm not sure it's a negative, but it can be viewed as a negative, is when you have to make the decision about pulling out of a country. 
because there are various reasons you pull out of the country. There's safety and security, emerging conflict, political instability, those kinds of factors. Uh, it can be a very painful decision. And at the end of the day, it's essentially the director's responsibility to make those decisions. And you have to carry, particularly in countries where you've had programs for lengthy periods of time, as the leader of the agency, you have to be clear in your, in, in your decision making and you have to be willing to articulate to the host country why you may have closed, suspended, or modified a program in order to not undo or to damage, frankly, the great act equity that you may have built over 10, 20, 30 years and suddenly have to keep pulling out for an unexpected and unanticipated reason. Those are, those are exposures that I think need to be managed very carefully. Well, I don't think there's any question um, that the Peace Corps has been a force for tremendous good and in terms of development. Aaron, we're fortunate to have Aaron as the director because he brings an extraordinary wealth of experience, really, uh, amongst all the directors, which will, so I, we, and we've all seen it in anecdotally. So the challenge, though, is in our, um, the work of development by, by its nature has a very long time horizon. And we are driven by the constant assessment, not even quarterly reports, but kind of uh, the metrics used for proving the work and as stewards of the public money, that is important. But I would put a bit of a marker in the conundrum that we have with the Peace Corps, and that is, to, how do you measure it in this way? Mm -hmm. All of us will have a story of the, of similar to this one. When I went to Kenya, Tanzania, after the bombings in 1995, I met with the Minister of Education, and he said, the first American I ever met, and the best teacher I ever had, was my Peace Corps volunteer teacher, we've all heard. Gave me the name 30 years. Prior, I came back to my office, looked him up. He was here in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Called him up, told him the story. There was a long pause on the phone, and he said, hmm, I'll have to look at the picture. There were 62 kids in my class. <laughs> so here's the question, and here's the development question. When do you measure the success of that Peace Corps volunteer's tenure? After his 27 months of service? or 30 years later in this rather random encounter with a Peace Corps director and a Minister of Education. So, which is not to say that we shouldn't assess and measure this. Of course we should, and Aaron is working mightily on that. But there is, by definition, a different metric we should hold on to, I think, in terms of the Peace Corps, for that personal element, for the bonds of friendship. That is one of the key goals in that transference. It doesn't as neatly fit into a very good question you raised. Should one of the metrics, Mark, be that the Peace Corps volunteer teacher is no longer the teacher in that school, but the country teacher? Oh, I, I'm a big there? believer in work your way out of a job. Okay. Good. <laughs> Secretary Chardler. I think there's no question that uh, in this globalized economy and world in which we work and live, that we need to have a better understanding of peoples across uh, the world uh, outside of our borders, and it's important that they understand us. I mean, I never met a white person until I came to America, and I had no impressions. But I do remember, and this is kind of, you hear stories about this all the time, I do remember seeing Peace Corps volunteers, uh, you know, but I never met them. Um, so in this worldwide economy, which we are now such an active participant, we need to understand how other people think and what their cultural background is, their philosophical outlook. And Mark's question is a very important one, which I alluded to initially in my opening remarks. And that is, you know, Peace Corps volunteers who are very often type A types, they, they want to have accomplishments <laughs> under their belt, and you know, and they're so anxious to get things going. And I tell them, you know, you, you're, you, are, part, you are a participant, um, a catalyst, a facilitator in this whole fabric of activity that's going on around the world. You may not be able to see the product of your labor, but I do, at least a larger part than you do. And I think that gives a lot of comfort to volunteers. And then if you add on that, not only the geographic expanse, but the temporal expanse of time, then you can see what, the, um, you know, what volunteers do. And they do this in very modest, one-on-one -on -one, uh, achievements, which is really so a heartwarming mm -hmm. because that's how volunteers make progress. They reach each heart, one one heart, you know, by one heart. 
if I may, I will say uh, one, two other things. One negative, one positive, and one negative. I'm always so impressed, also, with how fluent volunteers become in the language of their country, and we have the best core of of native speakers, almost, from these volunteers who are most of who are young, and they pick up the language like that. Uh, I went to Hungary in 1991. Hungarian is a very difficult language. And the president of Hungary said, you know, you have some volunteers here who are just amazingly good Hungarian speakers. Um, so, you know, we have now people who can speak another language, who understand the culture. When I went to Russia, I was, um, I was amazed by the can-do attitude that Peace Corps volunteers infused uh, to a people that had just emerged from uh, you know, the heavy yoke of totalitarianism, who felt that their spirits were crushed, this is 1991, and who felt they couldn't do anything on their own. And yet we had these wonderful young people from America who would tell these former Russians, Ukrainians, you know, Albanians, I mean, yeah, Albania was not a part of the former Soviet Union, but it was part of the um, behind the Iron Curtain, but uh, the peoples of the former republics of the former Soviet Union that they can have control over their lives, that they can start a new business if they wanted to, and that things will uh, m you know, come together. So I think the can-do attitude is another very, very wonderful uh, occurrence. I will say if there's anything negative, is that sometimes I think cultures are hard. Different cultures are very embedded and very, very complex. And sometimes, you know, we introduce a new element, and I think we need to be careful of uh, the unintended consequences when we go into a society and try to encourage them, inspire them to, to do all sorts of different things, that there might be un unintended consequences as well. Interesting, interesting. Let me ask if any of you would like to speak to the role of the Peace Corps in the foreign policy of the United States. So, we were always being asked if we were spies. Uh, I don't know if that's, I mean, we weren't, at least as far as I know. Um, I assume that still goes on, but we were also, um, as, as volunteers, kind of being contrasted with the folks who lived in the gated communities of the, uh, uh, of, of the embassy. That was when I decided I didn't want to be a foreign service officer, by the way. But I wondered if, if any of you would like to, to speak to the role that the Peace Corps plays in the foreign policy of the United States. Well, I think, first of all, we have this wonderful appeal by President Obama to Americans to serve, and that includes both internationally and domestically, and Peace Corps represents their response to that call, and that's an important part of our foreign policy. I think when citizens of the various countries see Peace Corps volunteers working with them in their communities, shoulder to shoulder, living under the same conditions that the average person in those villages and communities live, that has a tremendous impact. It gives them a perspective on America that they couldn't gain in any other way. Uh, this, the, the, this, is a, this is a tremendous experience. Everywhere all of us have traveled to, we've seen this time and time again. I think the other thing is that, that's important is that Peace Corps, of course, is an independent agency. But at the same time, our biggest supporters and cheerleaders for the Peace Corps are the U.S. ambassadors around the world. Oh, right. yeah. They recognize the value of Peace Corps volunteers. They do everything they can to support Peace Corps volunteers to make sure that they have the space to do the great jobs they're doing in all the sectors where we work. And that's, that's really remarkable, I think. And when you look at our partnerships with the governments, with the nonprofit sector, with the business community, Look at the fact that we engage and develop leaders, young leaders in the countries where we serve, and that we give Americans a chance to engage and develop leadership skills, which are going to be so important to our nation in this global connectedness that we all have talked about. I think uh, this, is a, this is an investment that we need to continue, we need to build on, we need to grow and expand. Okay. Anybody else on that? I guess part? the only thing I would add is I think the genius of the Peace Corps is that it is not part of our foreign policy effort. I think it's brilliant that it's separate. I think it's brilliant it's not part of the uh, walled communities if no other reason than the security for the volunteers. So there's no misunderstanding of that. I think it's brilliant that our volunteers are serving in areas that really, really don't have 
geopolitical. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of going to Ghana, I mean, there are places where our relationships are, are not of a foreign policy imperative. And I think from that, from that genuine, authentic service, going in peace and friendship, comes very good relations around the world. But decidedly not an affirmative statement about American foreign policy, Western values, any of the thing that was really uh, the inspiration of the Interesting. early days. Interesting. Interesting. Before we turn over to the audience, I want to ask one more question. And I want to pick up on, on a comment you made earlier, Mark, about the future of the Peace Corps. And you said you need to be thinking now about how the Peace Corps should be different in the next decade, in the next 50 years. Um, you mentioned having it be bigger and, and in more countries and so on, but should the Peace Corps be doing different things? Should there be a different emphasis? Do you want to yeah. pick up on that? And then yeah, I'd like I mean, to get I think everybody all else of us that have been in the Peace Corps, it was just the, the power of an idea, a very bold idea, brilliantly executed by Sergeant Schreiber. Everything about the Peace Corps, the ethos of the Peace Corps, is change and renewal right down to the five-year rule that staff can't work there any longer than five years, to bring in new renewal. So in thinking about this 50th, certainly I think the energy of the founders of the Peace Corps, President Kennedy and Sergeant Schreiber, would be saying, is it right for the next 50 years? Does one size fit all? Is it really 27 months for everyone? Isn't it a scandal that we have, what, you know, 10,000 applicants uh, of Americans who are wanting to do this, and I don't know if they're all tan fit and ready to be Peace Corps volunteers, but we say no <laughs> to thousands of them. Mm -hmm. Every one of us had a factoid, I'm sure, when we went up to Congress to get more money, that it's less money than the military marching bands. And I kind of like the military marching bands. <laughs> I mean, as a matter of priority. So mm -hmm. scale up with funding and volunteers, look at the length of service, it might be in interesting ways, greater collaborations and partnership. <laughs> the world is different than it was 50 years ago. And if anyone would have wanted us to say, keep mission central, but look at different areas, different exploration, use of technology, it would have been President Kennedy and Sergeant Schreiber. So yes, I think there are a myriad of different ways that we can honor the past and stay true to our core mission but do it in innovative ways with the kind of volunteers we're attracting in the world in which we live with the technology that they could use, the length of service that they could have, and working to be at the very forefront after 50 years of service world, which is to build a broader international uh, service agenda around the world. Secretary Johnson, how would, how would you want things to change. I have a question for the current director. And this is actually You're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the kind of questions that yeah. are being discussed, you know, when you're yeah. kind of um, um, in that position. Yeah. Are volunteers allowed to have cars? No. 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 Are they allowed to have scooters? No, or motorcycles. Okay. okay. No. So Too that's dangerous. Horses. Too horses. Too dangerous. Horses. Too dangerous. Well, these are, you know, these are some of the things that are mm -hmm. being continuously debated. Mm -hmm. And they're the subjects of robust debate uh, because you know you want to facilitate a volunteer's ability to get the job done, but you don't want to take them so much out of the uh, the, the environment in which they they're in that that, that distinguishes them as somehow as being different and thereby distancing distancing them, them uh, from the, uh, the the local nationals that they're supposed to work and uh, serve. So I think you know these questions are. Very timely, but um, and Mark, you raise wonderful questions. But the tug always is: how do you change, but still hold dear, you know, the the common culture and the touchstone values, which characterize the agency as well as the volunteers. Because I think the Peace Corps volunteer culture uh, is one of the strongest of any agency I've seen. Uh, that you know. Most volunteers can recite the three goals, and you know there there is a very strong culture, and, and the challenge is how do you preserve that and tackle some of the issues like technology is a real issue. So, All right, Joe, we have you obviously given a lot of thought to this recently at the Peace Corps, because we are looking at how can we 
support the next generation of Peace Corps volunteers? And how can the next generation of Peace Corps volunteers be most effective? One of the great advantages that we have in the Peace Corps now and in the future is that we recruit change agents. The people we recruit are highly motivated. They're talented. They're the best and the brightest of our colleges and universities and people who have experience in fields before they decided to go back to the Peace Corps later in their career. And so first of all, you're starting out with incredible raw material. The second thing is that we have a way of looking at the priorities of, of any given recipient country, host country, to determine what their priorities are. And they are also more demanding. That's the thing that's changed in the world of development. They're looking for people with higher skill levels. Because now the world is different from it was in 1960. When you went to Liberia, I'm sure they didn't have a national development plan. Now they do. And they, very few skills, as, to be perfectly and, honest. <laughs> But the, the, but the thing about the Peace Corps is that we take the journalist volunteer, right? And journalists, the Royal Arts graduates still represent about 85% of our volunteers. And we have trained them to be health care workers, to be microfinance supporters and, and promoters, uh, to be teachers, teachers of English as a second language, which is, by the way, one of the fastest growing areas uh, worldwide for the Peace Corps. So, and the other thing, and getting back to something that, that Elaine mentioned about linguistic skills, we train in 250 different languages. So we have, a tremendous, have tremendous resources that we can call upon to adapt to the new century and the new generation of Peace Corps volunteers. And I'm confident that we're going to be able to do that. And one size doesn't fit all. We're going to look at the length of service. We're going to look at the types of sectors we're in. We're going to be very, very, very thoughtful in terms of how we sharpen our tools to support Peace Corps volunteers. I would offer this, that uh, one of the aims of the Peace Corps going forward is that uh, the Peace Corps increasingly look more like the panel that is sitting uh, in front of you tonight. The reality is that the Peace Corps has, notwithstanding the great efforts of the current director, we made it a very high priority, my predecessors made it a very high priority, my successors did, but the reality is that the Peace Corps has a long ways to go to get to a place where it tr truly looks like America. Because the reality is, is that the America of 1961 is a different America. We're a much more diverse society. The Peace Corps is the face of America going overseas. And I think that we would be extraordinarily well served by embarking on a very, very aggressive effort. And Secretary Chow has made a reference to one of the challenges that we found when we did some of the field testing here in the United States, inquiring of people of color, why is it that you are disinclined to go in the Peace Corps? Guess what the most frequent response was? Economics, first generation college graduate. Can't do it, can't afford it, can't go off for two years, have to get a job. Those were the kinds of obstacles that people cited as reasons why they couldn't go into the Peace Corps. Those are reasonable and very viable and plausible explanations for why they can't. Not lacking a desire, not lacking the drive or determination or the willingness to serve, but having those economic hardships and other social hardships that, that exist within those communities sometimes. And so. Uh, I would simply urge that uh, all the you know, technology, the development, the training, all of those things are critically important. But I think that one of the greatest values that the Peace Corps can, can bring, and I'll never forget the experience of being in Morocco and having a young Moroccan say to me, you're an American? You don't look like an American. And I said, what do you mean I don't look like an American? He says, your skin is dark and your hair is dark. It's a little different shade these days, but it was all dark back then. Um, and he said, you don't look like an American. And it gave me the platform to talk about the diversity of America. Uh, and so I think this is a very critical component going forward and will be very, very important in the future for the Peace Corps to have uh, the depiction of the face of America in ways that we have not seen in the past uh, for the benefit of the Peace Corps and the benefit of the United States of America. Well, I want to invite members of the audience to go to the microphones and ask questions of the panel. One of the great traditions of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum is that all speakers agree to take questions from the audience. The audience, in turn, agrees to ask questions. So I will remind you of the rules for asking questions in the forum. Please identify yourself. Uh, please keep your question short and concise. And please make sure your question ends with a question mark. So, uh, will there are four microphones, two upstairs and two down here. We'll start over here and go that way. Hi, I'm Suzanne Kratzig. I'm actually an RPCV from Benin. Um, when you were director, Dr. or Dr. Vasquez? 
Mr. Okay. Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> director, former director. Your Honorable is good. <laughs> Um, and I now also work in the field of international development and security issues around the world are increasing tremendously. So my question now is how is Peace Corps responding to this? How are you deciding now which countries you'll go in? Are you expanding? I mean, it sounds as though you're expanding to include some more quote unquote higher risk countries like Colombia. Um, I've heard that you're going to Haiti, which having lived in Haiti last year, I'm very curious about. Um, and how that is affected by, even though technically Peace Corps is not part of foreign policy, it is in a way, how all of those decisions are being made regarding security and where you go. But of course. First of all, safety and security and the health of our volunteers, as you know from your service, is first and foremost for Peace Corps. And we're only going into those countries where we find an environment that's permissive, where we can safely put volunteers, where they can actually do the work. In the case of Colombia, we're going, we looked at Colombia very carefully. We're going into an area of Colombia where volunteers are going to be able to engage and teach uh, in a very safe environment. Uh, in Haiti, Haiti is a large country. There's lots of places where we can work with poor communities in Haiti where volunteers will be perfectly safe. But let me just say this, that before we go into a country, we conduct a very careful, in-depth assessment, working with all players on the ground in that country, whether it's on the American side or the UN, the international donors, the World Bank. We look at all factors to make sure that volunteers are going to be safe. That's first and foremost one of the things that, as director, all of us have had to be responsible for. Comment on that. I mean, you were obviously the director during one of the most challenging times. Well, uh, yours is a, is, a, is a very important question because it, it was a question that I was asked by many parents post 9 11. Uh, and I, I think I should point out, I think the number still holds that 60% of the volunteers in the Peace Corps today are women. I think it's still 60 40. You know, so, uh, whether we like it or not, the reality is, is that you know, the level of concern rises uh, from country to country and therefore the questions come quickly and very directly of the, of, of the Peace Corps director. Uh, and for us, uh, we established the Office of Volunteer Safety and Security, which conducts the surveys that the director has alluded to. And I think we have a very, very uh, credible process. Uh, some of you may remember that during my tenure, the Dayton Daily News uh, wrote a seven-part series on the safety and security of the Peace Corps. And when I interviewed with the reporter, I asked him why the interest in the Peace Corps. He said, well, it's time for somebody to look at the Peace Corps with regard to safety and security. And so that created a great deal of interest on the Hill, which generated legislation. Um, and it also generated tremendous response of the returned Peace Corps volunteer community because of some of the proposals that were being floated. Example, let's cluster the volunteers. Let's get three or four volunteers together to live together and put them in one location. Well, the, the feedback from the field and volunteers was overwhelming, quick, and decisive. Uh, the other was mandate that every Peace Corps volunteer have a cell phone, has to have a cell phone. Well, that induced a reaction uh, globally of not going there uh, for a lot of different reasons we won't go into. But the reality is, is that uh, the, the greatest stakeholder in all of this, as you can imagine, is the volunteer uh, who best knows, in concert with the staff and country director, uh, what the standards for safety and security are, are the best for that, or that country and which are, are most appropriate. But it is a constant state of vigilance. And I think any of us here, uh, at least, you know, I don't want to speak for other directors, but if there was anything that caused me to turn and toss was not legislation on the Hill, it was not funding, it was always safety and security. Because I needed to have the peace of mind as director of the agency that our policies and practices, both at headquarters and around the world, uh, were to a standard that could meet the test even in difficult circumstances. And I think by and large, the Peace Corps has done a remarkable job over 50 years of providing relatively good safety and security. Question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Rothmeyer. I'm a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. I live in Kenya where I was in the Peace Corps. I went in in 1965 and I went back to live there about 40 years later. And the thing that surprised me the most when I went back was the gigantic NGO community, which hadn't existed when I was there in the Peace Corps. And 
uh, I have my thoughts about NGOs, but my greatest worry when I saw them was, was the Peace Corps a template for the NGOs who come in and do for Kenya what Kenyans should be demanding that the government do for them? And when I hear about the expansion of the Peace Corps, that makes me very nervous because I think, and I would like to, I think what many Kenyans would say, and I've talked to many who don't think the Peace Corps is any different than all the other Western NGOs. In fact, they don't even live that badly. They would say to you, why are you sending the Peace Corps here? Why don't you use that money and help to fund programs that Kenyans 40% of whom are unemployed, including many students I teach at the university who can't get jobs when they finish. Why aren't you just giving them money so that Kenyans can do for themselves and so they can demand of their government that they provide the services that your Peace Corps people are providing? That's a great question. Mark, would you start off on that one? Yeah, well, first, thank you for your service as a volunteer as well, and to the other questioners that have served. You know, it's an interesting question, and one that I think the Peace Corps has wrestled with on and off. For I would observe sort of the scale, the question of the scale and the actual finances of the Peace Corps, the actual budget of the Peace Corps, and what that would really mean if the Peace Corps did not exist. You took literally dollar for dollar. I don't think you would have anywhere near the impact, the leveraging, leveraging, leveraging impact of a Peace Corps volunteer's time. I think your broader point, though, I would share your view that what has changed since when you were a volunteer, which is one of my observations about the partnerships for the next 50 years, is the explosion of the NGO community. And we would all agree it can vary in terms of its effectiveness. And the question I think for the Peace Corps going forward is, how can they knit into some of these organizations or not? I think the Peace Corps could um, provide extraordinary health workers around the world unlike any other alternative at much less cost, if we wanted to, if we really funded to do it. Um, but my own view is I, I think those partnerships are, are essential for the Peace Corps. Whether or not our volunteers are with them, there's different variants of how they're currently operating around the world. Um, I don't see that changing in, in, the, in the developing world as we, as we see the, that sector explosion. I think the question for the Peace Corps is, how do we best address it? My, to my own take, I would respectfully disagree with you that the, the dollar for dollar exchange would not have anywhere near the leveraging that volunteers have around the world. Hi, uh, my name is Vanessa Bradford Carey. I'm a doctor at Mass General and I work at the Harvard Medical School's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. And one of the things that we're trying to work on is, and this sort of, it's going to play a little bit off the last question, but um, is the idea of a, is a global health service corps. So creating loan forgiveness and scholarship in order to send people overseas into structured programs and in partnership with the, part, the places that we're working to really develop capacity, new doctors, new nurses, pharmacists, tech, you know, technological capacity. And to be able to begin to make investments, and somebody already mentioned this, to obviously make our jobs redundant. So it's really about building our partners. The idea has existed for a while. It's been shot down a number of times. And we're really trying to you know, rethink and reinvigorate it. There's been an obvious explosion in global health interest. It's begun, global health is now seen as central to our security, central to development, central to economy, central to overall well-being. And, um, it's a bit of a two-part question, and I apologize for that. Uh, but you know, one thought is obviously you've mentioned the idea of sending health workers overseas. So I'm curious, how often do you see doctors applying, or nurses, or people who have trained and are going overseas, you know, potentially going overseas to the Peace Corps? And my second question is, what do you think the feasibility is, or how can we begin to see a program like this take place, either to get the political will going or to get you know, the Hill to be willing to do a program like this or to see this as, would this be an extension of the Peace Corps? And though I'm supposed to end with a question, I also want to thank you all for gathering because this is a sort of incredible collection and it's very wonderful to hear all your perspectives. And now I'll flip back to my question. Thank you. Well, I think first of all, what your idea and what you're trying to do is a marvelous idea. And I think you ought to continue to discuss this with the various sources that you've been in contact with. 
I think that, uh, and to the extent that Peace Corps could play a partner in, in that type of initiative, it would be a perfect partnership for the Peace Corps. One of the things that we're trying to do, one of my new initiatives is to expand partnerships that Peace Corps is engaged with, both with the U.S. government agencies, with uh, the private sector, and with the leading development NGOs around the world. Because we need to be able to provide places to provide better training and places for Peace Corps volunteers to become more effective in terms of capacity development at the local level. So partnerships are part and parcel of what we're trying to do. I think in the case of getting back to your first question about the recruitment of uh, people who have health care experience and expertise, uh, there is a, a healthy percentage that we see of nurses that come in. Not many doctors, uh, more nurses. We see some retired doctors. As a matter of fact, uh, I met a retired doctor not too long ago who uh, wanted to go to the Peace Corps. He didn't want to have anything to do with medicine. He wanted to do something entirely different. <laughs> and he ended up being a TEFL teacher in the Ukraine, right? So, you know, we tried to accommodate those kinds of eclectic interests. Uh, but there is a pretty healthy uh, uh, cohort of, of nurses and people who have health care uh, experience going into, into the Peace Corps, and we try to encourage that. But the other thing that we do also is that we train people, generalists, who can work at the local level, at the grassroots level, to work on capacity development as extension agents, if you will, in the healthcare field, whether it's HIV, AIDS, or malaria. Peace Corps plays an important role in that. I would offer this, uh, as you were asking your question, I was um, reflecting on a con lengthy conversation that I had with then Senator Bill Frist of Tennessee, who is a, is a medical doctor, who actually introduced legislation to create a go global medical corps uh, that would provide a, a, a funding stream and a process for medical doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers to go overseas, uh, if you will, a la Peace Corps, uh, to provide that kind of, of support to uh, host countries. Unfortunately, the legislation, I think more for reasons of, of costs, uh, never really got off, off the ground, but I suspect that uh, in time this topic will probably emerge again. I will say this, that uh, when uh, I was director of the Peace Corps, we established the Peace Corps Office, uh, of global, the Global AIDS Office of Peace Corps, because we then applied for some PEPFAR funding, which Director Williams has done a great job of, of implementing and, and maintaining. Um, and I, as ambassador in, in Rome, Italy, uh, to the UN, uh, dealing with food policy, I had the opportunity to visit countries where people who are living with AIDS, who are on medication, also have to have, as you probably know from your training, have to have certain nutritional balance in their life in order to be able to sustain themselves and, and to basically to stay alive. And I, I do believe, and people are starting to write about it now, that we are headed in a direction where we are building a demand for the future. That is, people living with AIDS advance in age, they're going to require more intensive medical care and treatment and, and oversight uh, for their treatment that we may have to shoulder an increasing responsibility for, and that may create an avenue to create the kind of discussion that you talked about. This is a topic that is now starting to emerge because we are being successful in the PEPFAR and Global AIDS programming. The result is more people are living, they're living longer, they're sustainable, but they're requiring medical oversight and care. And so I think that that's an issue that we'll probably be hearing more about. So I think your question is apropos. I just wish we had a better answer. Thank you all for being here. Um, first of all, I'm Brian Moore. I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Ecuador, three and a half years of my life. I'm also one of the lucky uh, Peace Corps volunteers who was able to uh, marry a host country national. Um, which my country director thankfully signed off on, otherwise I would not have been allowed to marry my wife. Um, I'm also a student of international development here, and um, uh, Secretary Chow, as well as uh, Director Williams, you mentioned uh, the concept of diversifying uh, the Peace Corps as far as volunteers go, as well as strengthening the volunteers' profile, their, um, their ability to make change. And, I just wanted to ask, how does that fit in with um, sort of a lot of the, uh, the bills that are being looked at in Congress or the varieties of the bill in Congress as far as more Peace Corps? Um, uh, just sort of, I guess, to, to paraphrase, paraphrase development guru uh, Lant Pritchett, uh, who said, um, certainly more is better, but better is also better. And more is even better after better is better. <laughs> so... Um, uh, how does the sort of making uh, a better Peace Corps 
reconcile with making more Peace Corps? Um, Director uh, Williams and also um, Director Guerra mentioned about increasing, and I think maybe uh, Director Vasquez said as well, I'm not that sure I support a really big expansion of Peace Corps uh, because I really emphasize, I really think it's important to emphasize the quality of the experience. And we do have times when volunteers uh, arrive on site and uh, things aren't ready. Now part of that is because they're serving in very difficult countries in which there can be political change. We understand all of that. Um, but I think the quality of the experience is very important for the volunteer, for the host country, because it's their responsibility to provide meaningful employment that will ensure that volunteers are really being tapped well. So um, first of all, congratulations on <laughs> your uh, marriage. That's wonderful. And uh, this is another rule within the Peace Corps that apparently Peace Corps volunteers cannot get married uh, while they're in service unless they get signed off, sign off from the director. So is that another, another sacred cow that needs to be revisited, Director Williams? <laughs> sure. I think that, the, was that Glenn Prickett that you, that you quoted? Oh, I think that better is always better, of course. We would all agree with that. And I think the growth that the Peace Corps is going to experience in the future needs to be a growth with quality. We want to make sure we continue to provide a quality experience for these remarkable Americans who want to serve. Uh, that's why we're using the money that we receive from the Congress to invest in training, to invest in providing better staff oversight, uh, to invest in an IT platform that allow us to connect volunteers worldwide so that when we identify a best practice in Namibia that we can share that best practice and utilize it in Guatemala and Cambodia and South Africa and Thailand, et cetera. So I, there's no doubt about it that uh, my staff and I, we're focused on uh, trying to get it better and providing quality experience for the, for the volunteers. So I think those are the kind of investments that we want to see. It's important to the future of the Peace Corps. Uh, we need to have a measured quality growth in terms of our expansion. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Kerr-Kassler. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guinea a few years ago. Um, I was actually really in, interested in the comments made earlier about the changing of the terms of service or the duration of service. Um, I'd love if, if that could be expanded upon at some point with more detail, perhaps by uh, Director Williams. Uh, but my actual question was more to the question or this idea of improving uh, Peace Corps. And uh, I was actually, uh, the question was inspired in part by President Guerin's comments earlier about looking to the future and recognizing what Peace Corps was and celebrating it for what it was, but really looking in terms of how can we transform it or keep it um, abreast of what developing countries need today. And I think when Peace Corps was created in 1961, it was, um, it was evident that sending over young American college graduates, recent college graduates, was uh, a commodity, that we had the um, we had something that many developing countries lacked, um, and that was an expertise that was needed. And today, I wonder if that's still the case. I wonder if in many developing countries, um, sending over young, Amer primarily young American recent college graduates is going to be um, in the best interests of those countries. Of course, it's, I think we would all say it's in our best interests as Americans. We get a wonderful experience that expands our horizons and gets us engaged in uh, perhaps foreign policy and. Um, uh, international development and many other uh, aspects of what's going on in our world today. But I wonder if perhaps the future of the Peace Corps needs to be looking more towards creating, rather than taking teaching jobs um, and things like that, moving towards more of a technical support role. Um, and that would involve attracting people with more experience, uh, perhaps people with graduate degrees or people with more work experience, and putting them in positions where they can help the government um, at a higher level make uh, subst more substantial changes. Um, or helping them develop their policies in a way that would um, affect more people. I, I would just offer this, and Director Williams can, has a more contemporary uh, perspective, I think, but we established, as I mentioned earlier, they opened the first program in Mexico. And what the Mexican government made clear is that they wanted a different kind of a program. They wanted a program in a science, technology, environmental protection. And I think at the onset, the average age of the Peace Corps volunteer, my, my memory serves me correct, was in the, in the 40s first group of volunteers who went in, I met all of them, so I can tell you that they were definitely not 
in their 20s. They were north of 30, and probably most were north of 40. But these were men and women with uh, master's degrees in, in the sciences, public health, environmental uh, sciences and whatnot. And uh, then I had the opportunity to visit with them uh, and to see their programming. And it was a totally different type of program than what you're accustomed to because that's the kind of programming that the Mexican government was seeking from the Peace Corps. And just earlier tonight, the director was telling me that the Mexican government is looking to expand the Peace Corps uh, and introduce new areas that are probably somewhat non-traditional for Peace Corps, but I think are representative of where the Peace Corps could go in the future in some areas and in some countries, I think to your point. So I'll punch to the director. Can I say something to that effect? I'm going to inject a little controversy in here. Is that okay? Uh, <laughs> it's the forum. <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried it, you know, uh, you know, Director Vedigas Vasquez tried that, and actually, Paul Coverdale and I tried to do that uh, in the 1990s by expanding into the former Soviet Union. You are a returned Peace Corps volunteer, are you not? Yeah, if you feel strongly about this issue, you need to talk about it within the returned Peace Corps volunteer community because they are a very important constituency, they, uh, constituent base for the director. I listen to them all. I mean, I, I would hear from them all the time. And when Paul Coverdale went into uh, Eastern Europe and I subsequently went into the former Soviet Union, because of the compelling events of world history occurring at that time, uh, there were some Peace Corps volunteers who did not agree with that. And so you are very much a part of the discussion as to where Peace Corps volunteers go, how the, um, how the resources are being deployed. And during that period from, you know, uh, when we tried to go into the former Soviet Union and the Eastern European area, these countries who were more sophisticated, had more literate uh, populations, wanted more, more skilled volunteers. But it was hard to maintain that um, you know, after a certain period of time because the mechanisms of Peace Corps tended to recruit uh, younger and more inexperienced candidates. So, you know, there is a institutional issue here where, where the institutions have to change to recruit in a sustainable, long-term, permanent basis more skilled workers. I'm, I'm sorry, more skilled volunteers. I'm still, you know, thinking about Secretary of Labor stuff. <laughs> uh, but gonna, again, you are very, yeah. very important in part of that discussion. We're going to have to wrap this up, so I'm going to ask for two more questions, and I'm going to ask for the questions to be brief, and I'll take a question here, and then is there still a question up there? Okay. Question here, a question up there. Ask them quickly, and then we'll... Hi, good evening. My name is Todd Schweitzer. I'm a first year Master in Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School, and I just got back from the Dominican Republic as a Peace Corps volunteer in June. Great place um, to serve. Thank the you. Peace so, Corps. It's the best country I in the world. You on the your US. decision. <laughs> Uh, thank you sincerely for coming to speak. It's it's amazing for a uh, public. Question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like my question pertains to Peace Corps response or Crisis Corps, as it was um, when it was founded. It was started by Director Guerin through Director Vasquez, and now under the leadership of of Director Williams. If you guys could comment on the vision you originally had for Crisis Corps and what Peace Corps response looks like today and where it will be. Thank you. Thank you. Well, oh. let, let me get one more question, and then sure. we'll take them both okay. together. You don't have a question. We can take one more question up there. Hi, yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Bernstein. I'm a senior cadet at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. My question uh, is for Director Williams or for anyone else. Um, you identify change agents as being a raw product here from the United States in terms of sending abroad. Um, what has been done from the Peace Corps in terms of identifying change agents within the countries that you go to in terms of saying this is a raw product of the country that can uh, make substantial change for that country moving forward and providing them resources to do so. Thanks. Great. Do you want to start? Well, well, I think, Mark, why don't you comment about how you decided to create the Crisis Corps? And I want to talk about the extraordinary value of it right now. Sure. Well, um, the, the history, of course, was, as Elaine said, of listening to so many returned Peace Corps volunteers who would reflect on their years of service, very much want to go back, but we're frustrated that their lives are organized and somewhat encumbered that another 27 months was unthinkable. Yet the world needs the skill sets of Peace Corps volunteers because while they might have been relatively un, um, 
lacking a lot of experience when they first went in, coming back later in life, arguably with language skills, cross-cultural skills, technical skills. It was a cohort group in the United States of returned Peace Corps volunteers unlike any other. So the theory was to, to change a little bit, and change is hard in organizations, no question, of the length of service. So it's threaded through my opening point of looking perhaps a little bit um, a peak under the tent of other variants, initially with the return Peace Corps volunteer community. But I do think our own demographic is different in the United States. Skill sets are different. And so the, the theory was to be responsive to needs, to tap the rather unique skills and attributes and experiences that return Peace Corps volunteers could bring to an area of crisis. And, but to think about it in a way that's less than the 27 months. And I've been pleased with its progress uh, to date and the difference that it's made. I, I just, can I just say yeah. quickly, just 30 seconds. I salute Director Guerin for the vision that he had to establish Crisis Corps. And I thought of him often when we deployed Crisis Corps volunteers to assist after the tsunami uh, in, in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, um, and the response was incredible. And then we tapped into the Crisis Corps in a way that the Peace Corps had never done before. But after seeing the devastation of the tsunami and then seeing the devastation of Katrina, uh, we deployed Crisis Corps volunteers, Peace Corps Crisis Corps volunteers for the first time on American soil. And the response of return Peace Corps volunteers lit up the switchboard with hundreds of our PCVs who said, send me down there, I can do some good work down there. So I salute you for that great vision. Yeah. Today, the crisis corps that Mark created is now called Peace Corps Response. If we didn't have a Peace Corps Response unit at Peace Corps, we'd have to invent one because we need to be able to respond quickly to emerging opportunities that present themselves. We've been able to go back into Sierra Leone and Colombia because we've had Peace Corps Response. After the earthquake in Haiti, we had about 200 fluent Haitian Creole returned Peace Corps volunteers prepared to go back into Haiti 48 hours after the earthquake. This is a tremendous asset, and it demonstrates the incredible resilience and interest in ongoing uh, service of the Return Peace Corps volunteer community. So that's a really important, and I applaud Mark also for doing that. It's really been important. Uh, so now when we see an opportunity to go into a country, whether we haven't been there for a while, we're going to go in in terms of a new program, we have a tool that we can use to provide experience, uh, talented, uh, volunteers with the language skills to move into a country. Uh, I also want to answer the question the gentleman asked me from the Coast, was it the Coast Guard. Uh, how do we find change agents in countries uh, where we work so they can make a difference and impact and have an impact in their country? That's one of the number one things that we constantly search for in the countries where we serve. We're trying to identify the best organizations and the best leaders of those organizations so we can place Peace Corps volunteers to work with them to assist them in their role of making a difference in their societies. There's nothing more important. And there's thousands of Peace Corps stories about Peace Corps volunteers who worked with individuals like that who ended up being leaders in their countries in all, in all sectors. So this is an ongoing, very important, from day one, from 1961 on, we've been looking for change agents and we continue to support those important individuals who make a difference, the men and women who really can make a difference in terms of development in their countries. We do have to bring this panel to a close. Please join me in thanking the panel for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah.